back. CIT Group specializes in lending to small and mid-sized businesses. But since the financial crisis, it's been somewhat of an uphill battle for the company. Let's take a look at some history. As you can see, the company received over $2 billion in TARP money back in December of 08. That did not seem to be enough to save it from bankruptcy in November of 09. CIT then emerged from bankruptcy just one month later. And while the company's stock has made a comeback since, it has been quite a ride. In February 2010, John Thane was appointed chairman and CEO to revitalize the firm ever since. So what is he doing to help bring the company back to life? And what is his views on the economy right now? We are joined by John Thane right now in a CBC exclusive. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, Maria. Thanks so much for joining us. And you're back here, one of your uh, former uh, uh, haunting uh, s spots at the yeah. New York Stock Exchange. So, yeah. so thanks for, for coming here. So first off, let me get your take on the overall economy. You've got a great vantage point in terms of small business uh, and what you're seeing in lending. How would you characterize things right now? Well, so Maria, we have a perspective on the economy, both from our lending to small business, we're also the largest factorer in the United States, and we're also one of the largest rail car lessors. And with the exception of housing, which is not doing well at all, our perspective on commercial businesses is they're doing okay. The economy is growing, it's growing slowly, it's not creating a lot of jobs, um, but I don't see us going into a double dip recession. Why, why is it not creating jobs? I mean, you're hearing from these small and mid, mid cap companies. Uh, why aren't they putting the money to work right now? What, what's the issue? Well, as you probably know, small and middle sized companies create about two thirds of all net new jobs in the United States. And they have three main concerns taxes, uh, health care costs, and regulation. And those three things are what are constraining them. And are you expecting anything in that regard from the president's speech tonight? I mean, what can policymakers do in terms of taxes, in terms of health care spending, and, and, and really these major issues? Well, what's been leaked out so far really doesn't address any of those things. I think, for instance, on taxes, the U.S. has one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world, and yet you have companies, big profitable companies like GE, that pay no taxes. Well, that tells you that system is broken, and we need to rewrite the corporate tax rate and bring tax rates down, but we also need to eliminate all the loopholes so that it's a much fairer system. So even bringing ta corporate uh, tax down, then, you're saying would actually still uh, increase revenue because you're taking away the loopholes. It, it certainly could, and a lot of these small and middle market companies, they can't take advantage of all the loopholes that big global international companies can. So what are you going to do then at CIT to ensure long-term success, long-term profitability? the CIT group in light of all of these issues that the companies that you serve are facing? Well, our business is growing. So in the second quarter, our fiscal second quarter, we made over a billion dollars of new loans to uh, small and middle market companies. Um, our rail car business, again, if you exclude those cars that are in housing, uh, we're about 99% utilized. Rates are going up. Um, we continue to see growth across all of our businesses. So it's really a function of getting more growth and then being able to fund it attractively. I'm going to come back to CIT in a moment, but, but focus a bit on uh, some of the issues of the day, the banking sector, uh, the European issues. Yesterday we had Steve Schwarzman on, the chairman of the Blackstone Group, and here's what he said about the banks in Europe. I want to get your take on what's going on in Europe. Listen to Steve Schwarzman. The basic problem uh, in Europe is that the banks are really short capital if you mark to market all the sovereign debt. Uh, and, and so it's difficult to know what to do about that problem because the more you talk about it and disclose it, the lower the bank stocks go, the more difficult it is uh, to raise capital. What's your take on what's going on in Europe and, and in the banking sector right now, John? Well, what Steve said is exactly right. The, um, the banks in Europe own a lot of the sovereign debt of the European sovereigns. That sovereign debt, if you marked it to market, is a fraction of par, and it would, in essence, make the European banks insolvent. Um, they need to be recapitalized. Mm -hmm. So, of course, a lot of worry about the U.S. banks and the exposure to the European issue. Uh, Bank of America, of course, has been clobbered. Um, Merrill Lynch and sold Merrill Lynch to, to Bank of America in the darkest days uh, of, this, uh, of this country. And, of course, at the time, you were a real hero by getting a good price for shareholders. Look back for us. Do you regret selling Merrill to Bank of America? Well, Maria, I'm, I'm very sad that I had to sell the company because it was a great company and it continues to be a great franchise. And, by the way, it's making a huge percentage of Bank of America's overall profitability. But at that time, 
to protect our shareholders, to protect our employees with what might have happened even a week later. You know, Merrill easily could have gone the way of Lehman. And so I felt it was absolutely crucial that I do my job protecting the shareholders, protecting the employees, and at least at the time, we got a great price. So as you sit here today and, and see what has happened to Bank mm -hmm. of America, and you make a great point that the merger with Merrill provided Bank of America with really the profit engine mm -hmm. since 2008, putting Countrywide aside and all the issues that the company faces. Would it be worth more to shareholders? Would you endorse, as someone who knows this company as well as you do, spinning Merrill off? What do you think? Well, I, I don't really think as, um, as the company exists today, that would make very much sense. Their businesses have huge potential. The problems they're experiencing right now are really all coming out of countrywide, out of the countrywide mortgage exposure. And once they get through that, I actually think Bank America and the combined franchise will be very profitable and very successful. So what do you think, then what do you do in that environment? I mean, do you, do you try to sell the mortgage part of the business? Do you, do you try to just swallow it, take the loss now so that you could begin the recovery? What's your yeah. take on what's going on there in terms of uh, countrywide? Well, they, they have to get through it. They basically have to solve as many of the lawsuits as they can. They have to try to get it behind them, but it's very, very difficult. These are multi-billion dollar settlements, and it's just going to take a little bit of time. They're, I think they are going to get through it, but as the economy eventually recovers, as they get worked through the, those issues, uh, I, I continue to be very optimistic about their prospects. Well, in terms of the housing market, I mean, that's the one area that has been really unable to participate in this recovery. The, the bad mortgages at, at, at Bank of America is one part of the story. Mm -hmm. But what do you think it's going to take to turn housing around? Uh, I think only time. It, it, it's going to take years. There is no quick fix to this problem. Um, you know, the existing stock of housing that's for sale, but also the huge backlog of foreclosures. And the fact that foreclosures now take years in some states means that the problem's just going to be prolonged. So I, I don't think there's a quick answer to this. I think we're going to see housing and house prices suffer for the next several years. And, and it's partly the regulatory environment, which was in some cases supposed to be the fix, that is somewhat of the uncertain sort of elephant in the room out there, right? I mean, the regulatory environment in terms of some of these rules being written as we speak, people are not sure how things will play out. Yeah, in particular, the uncertainty as to how you can actually work through the foreclosure backlog. And, and, and they really need to get this, get this um, so solved. And prolonging it doesn't make things better. Amazing that it's been 10 years this week since September 11, 2001. And of course, the uh, New York Stock Exchange has uh, a, a, a lot planned tomorrow with many of the people who came back on September 17th to ring the bell after the exchange was closed to commemorate this, uh, this upcoming uh, terrible anniversary. What are your thoughts coming back to the exchange today on this day? Well, you know, Maria, I, I was running Goldman Sachs at the time. We were just down the street from here. And the first thing that you remember, and you frankly can never forget, is the personal tragedy of, of that event. And, you know, I remember watching 110-story World Trade Center and seeing it pancake down and knowing that every single person in that building was likely dying. And that's the kind of event that just stays with you forever. And, and, and it doesn't seem like it was 10 years ago, um, but, but that's something that you'll always remember for the rest of your life. When you see how different the New York Stock Exchange is today, not only from 10 years ago, but five years ago, um, when you were here, uh, it's, it's quite different, isn't it? I mean, a lot fewer people, technology has changed things. There's been a massive change. Well, that's true, and, and that's frankly inevitable, and that's really one of the things I did when I was here, which was what, through the acquisition of Archipelago and then ultimately the acquisition of Euronext, we, we had to make it more electronic, we had to broaden out its product mix, uh, we had to make it more global, and all of those things have happened. Uh, I think it's still pretty impressive, though, that the floor is still here, that it's still a place where people look to for American capitalism. Yeah, and, and of course, there's been a real global story. Deutsche, yeah. Boris, and NYSA, you've got consolidation going on throughout the industry. Are you expecting more consolidation? I mean, knowing your resume, whether it's Goldman Sachs, 
Max Merrill here uh, beyond. There's been an enormous change in business in terms of the global story. Do you think we'll see consolidation continue in financial services and where might you expect it to be uh, most uh, poised? Well, I, I think at this point we now have a much smaller number of very large financial institutions and I don't really see that type of consolidation among the big players getting even bigger. I think there's a reasonable argument that some of the big, really the big players are even bigger now than they were before the financial crisis, so the too big to fail argument is actually worse today than it was prior to 2007. Right, so that's why people are saying they look at Bank of America and they say this company should be chopped up. I mean, in the books, do you think it should be chopped up? No, I, I think that um, when you look at the global competitors, you know, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, uh, J.P. Morgan, they have to compete with Deutsche Bank. They have to compete with Sockgen, and they have to compete with UBS. Those are also big global financial institutions. We have to be competitive in the world. Let me, let me get back to CIT for a moment. You've paid down a lot of debt, shaving the total uh, first and second uh, uh, lien uh, from about $14.5 billion to $3.5 billion. What's your next step? Give us your priorities for the company. Well, the, the main thing that we're doing right now is restructuring the debt and moving more of our businesses into our bank and growing the bank. So the bank funds itself with uh, 1 or 2 percent deposits, and that in this market environment is a much, much more uh, competitive place for us to be. We are growing our assets nicely, which is good, but it's really getting the funding sources in line and then ultimately solving all of our regulatory issues, which, you know, we're making very good progress on. Isn't that a main issue? I mean, do, how do you ensure that the expense uh, of debt, the debt costs, do not hamper growth at the company? Well, you, you, you have to pay down the expense of debt and replace it with much cheaper debt, which we've been doing. And as you said, we've done that with about $14 billion of debt so far, and we, we have more to do. But even now, if you look at our U.S. Uh, originations, we're originating about 70% of our U.S. assets in our bank. Do, do you believe categorically that CIT can, can stay as a standalone company, or will you eventually sell the firm? Well, I, I think it absolutely can stay independent if, if we want to. You know, it, uh, it, it is generating very high yield, very attractive assets. That makes it an attractive uh, company for others. But right now, we're just executing our strategy and running the company. John, it's good to have you on the program. It's always good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. John Thane is chairman and CEO of CIT Group. We'll see you soon, John. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so much. Up next on the program, we'll hear former winners of CNBC's Million Dollar Portfolio Challenge on how the competition has